In March 1993, a month before their 30th birthday, they finally received permission for transfer from Broadmoor to Caswell Clinic, a medium secure unit in Wales. The first step on their road to freedom. The day before they travelled, Jennifer felt unwell. I was at home and I was rang about, the phone went about nine o'clock at night and it was Aubrey to say that Jennifer had died. live once again this is the solvable mysteries podcast this is episode number 42 my name is Juras, and as always i'm joined by my co-host glenn heikov how are you man hey doing okay just hanging in there like everybody else uh ready to talk about a, a pretty interesting case i think um you uh, and me as well because well, to be honest, before we, before I personally looked into this case, I was sort of anticipating it to be, uh, like a little bit more creepy and like horrifying than it actually turned out to be. So, but it's good in that way. I guess we could definitely shed some light uh, in this uh, heavily saturated YouTube true crime mystery. I guess, Lane, where, you know, I think a lot of people got it wrong in this case, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, I think that'll be, that'll be an interesting part at the end about how we feel about how, how the people in this case were treated and whether, like, too much was done or not enough or the timing. It's one of those, one of those things where I think it's, it's, it's a good example of, of trying to examine, like, uh, I guess issues that, people talk about now with respect to like maybe things like racism or, or how people are treated in society, but also things like mental health. And, and it's, it's pretty fascinating. It's, it's an interesting thing too, because um, the, the two people involved are actually um, they're the children of Caribbean immigrants. And um, since I'm, I'm also married to somebody from the Caribbean, um, I have kind of my own take on, some of the, the the stuff in this particular case in terms of like maybe uh, the cultural aspects and some of the accents and things like that involved. It was just pretty interesting to, to kind of have that that take after mm. after you know being married to somebody from the Caribbean for, for 20 years. Right. I didn't even think about that, but yeah, there there is a connection, like at least some sort of a connection to your personal life. You know, this yeah. well, obviously your your wife is not from Barbados, but before we jump into all of that, uh, we're going to be talking about the, I, I don't even know how to word this, uh, probably the Silent Twins is uh, a good uh, name for this podcast, it's either that or June and Jennifer Gibbons, so you can see June and Jennifer if you're watching this on uh, our YouTube page, uh, they were essentially identical twins, and uh, they had developed a really, really, uh, I guess, a good way to put it, a love-hate relationship between them, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was interesting because it, it mirrored, I guess this is why people get fascinated with the, the topic of twins, because especially identical twins. Yeah. Because sometimes ident identical twins do things. Because, I mean, you know, identical twins are essentially the a, a clone of each other. They have the same... In many cases, the exact same. I think it's like the exact same chromosomal layout. Like everything's the same. So it's, it could be. I guess it isn't always, but it could be essentially the same person twice. Right, which is really so that, odd. Yeah. Well, before we get into the case, I always thought that having a twin would suck. You know, <laughs> that's just what I thought. Like I, I definitely <laughs> want to be. You know, I, I definitely wouldn't want to have someone who looks and acts exactly as me right that that would just not be a good time because you sort of want to be like you know your own person your own individual and i guess a lot of twins run into this issue later on in their lives right so um you could probably tell that 
sometimes twins will actually when they are completely identical sometimes maybe in their teenage years they like try to have like different hairstyles different clothes you know just to like sort of stand out a little bit right because at least that's what i've noticed in my life you know when i i knew some twins in school at, at you know in the first grades they were like completely the same two kids but then after you know a few years they were like really trying to like hang out with different people and just do different things you know so you know there there, there was probably a touch of that sentiment in this case as well yeah it's, it's so weird I, I it's it's always funny like i don't know if you ever had this happen where um when, when i was in high school i didn't even know this one dude in my class was a twin so I remember, <laughs> like, so, like, I mean, you know, I, I was, I was, right. I was new to the high school, so I didn't really know, like, oh, like yeah, everybody okay. at the school yet. <laughs> okay. So okay. it was like, you know, what I mean, so it was like, it was like, like, like month one right. of the class, and I'm walking down the hall, and the dude passes me, and then like, <laughs> like, ten seconds later, he passes me again. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's a, that is, that's all right. Like, and then it, yeah, it's, it's, okay, it's yeah, so it's fascinating. I, I don't know. I, I, I th- when I was, I used to kind of wish I had a twin just to have somebody have my back. I guess I don't know. Maybe that's like the the upside. For real? Is mm-hmm. I mean, in, yeah. In, yeah. I mean, I mean, in, in, in this case, unfortunately, like you said, even though there was some some clashing involved, it almost seemed like the problem with this case was they they had each other's back too much. Like they, oh, yeah. they they were they were a little bit too dependent on each other, and it, it kind of allowed them to slip into. I mean, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. I guess mm. we, we get into it. We'll see how much of this was intentional and how much of this was just going to happen because of mental health issues. But yeah, I mean, it, it certainly. I think their conclusion was, even though it was a really special part of their life, that the things were like not super positive for them. Being right. Twins. Now I've said, like in the beginning uh, part of this podcast, that. Uh, I anticipated it to be a little bit more creepy and it turned out to be not as creepy as a lot of people made it out to be. Well, there is one little thing in this case uh, we, we will talk about, but there is something creepy also in this case. Like what I'm trying to say here that it's not only scientific. I definitely think there's going to be a really, really weird part in this in this show where something happened that either really baffled me and I couldn't really find an explanation online. I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about, but like before yeah, we actually, yeah. before we get to that part, I guess let's, let's take it from, from the top. So, um, I have this, uh, little write up here. So we are now looking at June and Jennifer Gibbons. So as I've mentioned before, they were identical twins and i guess their background is as you've mentioned from the caribbean from the island of barbados and june and jennifer were daughters of caribbean immigrants gloria and aubrey gibbons and essentially the gibbons moved from barbados to the united kingdom in the early 60s as part of the wind rush generation so what what is the wind rush generation like I, this is the first time I'm hearing about this. Have you? Um, you know what? I, I think so. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Britain's kind of an interesting place because sometimes, if, even though, obviously, England, England, just like Europe, is, is so old in terms of its history and the different phases. But um, what happened was England had these colonies. I mean, obviously, I'm 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 talking from one. Um, right now, <laughs> right. <laughs> we used we used to be one of them uh, until we we had a little pushback. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah, they wanted England you to pay up for the tea or something. For the the, the tea taxes, yeah, we, <laughs> right. we didn't, and we you, didn't like and that. You were so not sure. having those. No, no taxation without representation. Yeah, so yeah, um, uh, yeah so you know, they also had um, a lot, extensive uh, territories in the Caribbean. As a matter of fact, that was essentially what. England and France and Spain were all mutually fighting each other for, for several hundred years was just all the resources, um, to be had coming in and out of, uh, uh, North, South and Central America and the Caribbean. So England had, um, you know, like Jamaica, 
um, Belize, where my wife is from, uh, a lot of other kind of assorted islands and areas in the Caribbean where they did yeah. um, things like they made uh, like they had like sugar plantations and cotton and things like that. So um, what happened was up until you have, you have a period in history, you have imperialism or, or colonialism, and then you have an era where um, I think after World War II, as the kind of the world order reset and, and things started changing and you had a lot of these countries, some of them, a great many of them wanted their own independence anyway. And, you know, up, up until this point, they'd been British territories. Yeah. So it was almost like they were part of England or part of the United Kingdom. Um, so after that, you know, a lot of these places, they want self-rule. And frankly, honestly, for a lot of these European countries that had these colonial legacy countries, they couldn't even really afford them because in a lot of cases, these countries weren't actually turning a profit. So it wasn't like they were really right, right. necessarily, you know, getting that much, you know, so like uh, obviously like India and Pakistan is a big example of that too, where that place probably was turning a profit, but obviously they wanted their own freedom, et cetera. But I think as part of kind of making up for the, there was a sense in England that they'd kind of exploited a lot of these places and that, not everybody had really benefited from that. And, you know, so, so, so I think as part of trying to make good on that legacy of, you mm. know, I, I guess we'd call it oppression. Um, they, they, the United Kingdom still does this. Um, they have policies where in, in many cases you can come and, and live in the United Kingdom, you know, and get work and become a citizen potentially. I, mean, I know for my wife from Belize, she says that was always an option for people from Belize to go find work in England, um, which is pretty nice. And that, that is like, I think that's right. kind of the, the offering. So this is a long winded way of saying that as you get into kind of the sixties and seventies and beyond, you had an influx of people from other parts of the world. Uh, so this is why you see a lot of people from India and Pakistan now in England, but you also see a lot of people from the Caribbean. So from Jamaica, um, Barbados, um, Belize, Etc. So, you know, but I think the the hard part is, just like it is for any group, like it's hard to be in the first bunch of people that come, right? No, oh, yeah. So, no, yeah, because yeah. there's gonna be like backlash, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I think I mean, like I'll, I'll just say this because you know, United States culturally, um, you know, at least originally inherited a lot of its culture and attitudes from England. England is notoriously um, ethnocentric, and England mm. <laughs> England really doesn't. I mean, it, it, I'm sure this has changed to some extent, but traditionally, England has been pretty anti-foreigner. So I think to be a foreigner in England, um, especially back then in the 70s, right, was or the 60s actually. What I'm looking here when they were born, um, that must have been a pretty tough road. So that you know, there was a lot of prejudice. And like, so case in point, um, the two people we're going to talk about today, June and Jennifer, um, you know, the parents are immigrants from Barbados. I think they're, they're actually, it's, it's kind of, it was a little bit strange because the Wikipedia had sort of inaccurate birthplaces for them. It looks like they may have been born oh, actually in Yemen. Oh, yeah. We, Wikipedia was, it was strange because they're twins, but they had them. Oh born yes, in exactly. Places, exactly. Which was like now that, I, that now I see sense. what you I mean. Yeah. yeah. It says that they and were born I, in Barbados, but as you've, yeah, like I, yeah. I definitely believe they were born in, in, in the, where were they born again? I'm well, looking so, at. So, 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 for, for Jennifer, it says aid in Yemen. So that might have been when right. her father was working for the British military. Um, because her father. Unless you can or, get from Barbados to Yemen in one minute. Yeah. yeah <laughs> that's then, probably not the case. I, I think, because yeah, they, were they were probably, twins, they were probably, so they were born like one minute apart. So, like, you know, you can't be born right. in Barbados and then in Yemen the next minute. You know? <laughs> so that's. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, no, uh, that's, no. I mean, he, was, he did work for the Royal Air Force, so I don't know. Yeah, so. Maybe, I'm, I think that's that. That was case in point. That was, I think, when a good part of the Middle East was still still had like a lot of Western military bases, um, yeah. as as those those places were kind of getting their own independence. So I I think what happened is I think her father was 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 you know working for the the Royal Air Force and they were at at a yeah there we go they were born in a military hospital. It says here in Aden, Yemen. So okay, um, you know Wikipedia we already caught a mistake with their their info. But the yeah, Wikipedia so anyway, was actually not that 
well informed, I guess, on this case in particular, you know? I mean, it, I feel like yeah. it could have been a, a little bit bigger than it was, because it didn't have that much it, information. And it's kind of a famous case, too, with a lot right, of media coverage. Exactly. It's, it's kind of it's a little strange. Maybe maybe it's just yeah. that it's a older older thing and so much has happened with the new generation. But, yeah, so, um, you know, they, they moved back to England, you know, at some point during the, their childhood. Right. And, you know, let me, let, me, let me stick a pin in that for a second. Already, that might have been like a little bit of a disconcerting experience because, like, a, a military base, like, would they, they call them like army brats and things like that? People that are that are part of military families. Army brats. It's already, I've never heard about. Yeah, them. yeah, it's, 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 it's a term here. Yeah, so like, okay. like if you're if you're someone whose whose dad is like maybe a career military person, yeah, you're often um you're often moving a lot. Like you're moving oh, like every yeah, couple. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's supposed to be. A pretty rough childhood. I don't. It, it doesn't really sound like they. It sounds like they had a little piece of that, but then they got to England and they, they were relatively stationary. But already, you know, that's a little weird. Is like you're born mm. somewhere in the Middle East, but you're not Middle Eastern, and then you're moving back to like your new home, which is England, but just not, still not where your parents are from. So that's even even for your parents, oh, it's yeah, not like yeah, home. Yeah, home yeah. Yet. I, I, mean? I haven't it's even like, thought about it like that. Like these two girls, they actually never had like a you know like like a something they could call like home you know because like yeah, place, they were like all over the place welcome them. right exactly. yeah yeah because they're, they're always like that's a good kind of like the other they're always yeah. the, the 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 visitors or the the new arrivals but you know obviously they wanted england to be their home i mean they they, they grew up no doubt, um yeah. you know they grew up they grew up grew up english and and you know wanted to be english residents and citizens etc so um, but yeah, I mean, already the hard part was apparently where they lived and where they went to school. They were the only um, Afro-Caribbean children. So this uh, is yeah. So they went to school, by the way, in Wales. It was not England. Oh wow! So oh, wow. Uh, yeah. as you can see from like the map, Wales is like a different country from England. <laughs> but like I, yeah. I feel like from all of the UK uh, countries, Wales is like the most integrated into England, I believe. Because, like, all the other countries, you know, like Northern Ireland or Ireland or, like, the, you know, the just the Ireland or the Scotland, these countries are, like, you could sort of distinguish them, but Wales is, like, it's like that weird cousin of England, you know? They, they're, yeah. like, really connected with each other, but they did go to, uh, to Wales. And, you know, the funny thing here is that this is the city pretty much where... Uh, they grew up in uh, it's I'm not sure if I can find the name of the city it's it was Haver Ford West in Wales so they moved there in the seven in 74 so you know what the interesting part is I'm man, I'm pretty sure I've been here oh wow I, I, when I was living in England for like a year I remember I had to go to get my like legal documentation papers or something like that because back then England was still in the European Union and since right. I'm from Lithuania I, I get to you know go there and work there you know like whenever I want at least I used to be able to do that so I went there to live like for almost like a year and man I remember traveling to like Wales for those papers even though I was living in like England not in Wales but like pretty close to Wales uh, near Birmingham, and I was, and I, man, I, re like, this street, I definitely think I've been here, I think this is where I got the, the legalization papers or something, so, it's definitely, uh, it, it, it gave me flashbacks, but you can see that this place <laughs> is really nice, all I'm gonna say is that this yeah. place looks amazing, like, oh my god, you know? It's, you know, it's funny how, how our perceptions, because I know, like, like, when you and I have talked, You've mentioned how, like, you know, where you where you live is sort of post post Soviet, <laughs> so it has the post the post it's, it's Soviet pretty, designs. It's not yeah, and and, it, and you know what's weird is for me, for some reason, I, guess, I often have this perception of, of 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 the UK. And by the way, I'm sure all these wonder if all these Welsh people are going to be mad at me now for mistaking Wales for England. Um, <laughs> to your yeah. to your point, to your point, they got they got conquered pretty early. I mean, they were they were they were, they were so close that it, I think it was hard to not have the English they stomp over had, the place. They never had a chance, you know. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> come on. 
it's too hard. Yeah. So there was. I, I've actually read about some of the military campaigns, but yeah, some of those those, those kings right. and dukes yeah. out there. Thing going, but yeah, I mean, you know, for me, it looks really urban. Like it looks really crowded. So for me, being from the part of the U.S. I'm in. Mm. Where like you know, there's space between houses, and and even now, like I kind of wish I lived someplace with even more space between yeah. houses. And I, more, I definitely more get land. get what you're saying, but at the same time, this yeah. city right here, the 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 Silent Twins grew up in, it has twelve thousand uh, people population. So for uh. that small city to have such a nice like such nice areas, you know, because like. We don't have streets like like the only place you could find something like this is in the capital city or in the city that that I'm in that are like both like uh, you know somewhere around a half a million people population cities you know and this is just a little town in Wales and it looks really nice it looks like it looks like a nice place so yeah like, uh, I guess that's that's all I wanted to say man and I definitely it, think I've been here so that's also like uh, really like. It, it, it definitely brings me flashbacks that's funny yeah I mean uh, yeah I mean it certainly like, yeah, looks like a, a pretty nice place to live but I, apparently it wasn't for um, oh yeah June and Jennifer they just I mean I, I guess I, like, it, so it seems like a couple things are going on so the first problem was like I said uh, you know they were they were ethnically the only folks from their background and and so then right away like like you don't really mm. right away they must have seemed strange and foreign even though obviously they're they're from the area at this point because they've, they've grown up there yeah. um you know just just the kids you know just something different kids especially like i, I guess uh, that, that's the thing that my my perception of the uk is just like any place people are, might be kind of quick to pick on people that are different than them and maybe especially back then it, and, and, and I know that's yeah, also maybe the back case then, even, even where I live right now yeah. right now the UK man when I was in the UK you know I saw people of all types of ethnicities all the time oh yeah, so yeah. maybe things are, it's very are different changed now. yeah this was yeah, yeah, like I, this was happening in the 70s so you know obviously yeah, things it, were it, different it, and just to be fair like I know my some of my neighbors down the street here who um, I think they're East Indian. The guy told me that like back in the 80s when, when they first moved in here, all the people around here were saying like terrible stuff to them because they, they were so different than everybody else. And mm. like, like nobody does that now. So like, yeah, things just stuff changes. You know, it was like what, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. So, yeah, no doubt. you know, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's be fair. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fair about that. So yeah, um, you know, they, so they had that issue going on and then another thing that was that was interesting about them was they seemed to have had a pretty prominent speech impediment and i think i want i was trying to figure out so uh, you know both you and i watched a show about them that was made in the yeah. uk in the mid 90s i think it was called like without my shadow or something like yeah, that yeah something like that i'm uh, just gonna like quickly was, find it yeah so she was so this, this was interviewing um june june gibbons and yeah she was pretty hard back then i it may have improved because i think this was like not that long after she had kind of been through a lot of the more recent events in her life so she was still kind of in recovery at this point she was still getting psychiatric treatment at this point yeah there she is her accent uh i think we should play it here i think yeah not yeah, everyone just will hear sense. so just to get a sense of her yeah. accent, I'm just gonna play this audio. So let's listen in for like a half a minute or something. June and Jennifer were late speaking and shared a speech impediment that made them difficult to understand. We had our language. We had our language. Me, me and my sister spoke. We knew what we were saying. My mother had to guess what we were saying. And she was one that was a bit worried about us. And they're always shy, and they're not, you know, not speaking. Well, they spoke what we can understand. And we didn't speak to anybody. They thought they were extra strange. That we didn't speak to anybody, and they kept saying, "Why won't they speak? Can they speak English? Why can't they talk?" And the more they said that, the more they shut up. So yeah, so that's pretty much uh, how June speaks uh, now, yeah. or like something like that, uh, where. 
I mean, I personally can understand everything that she says, but there, you know, as I was watching this documentary, it's called The Silent Winds Without My Shadow. It was made by the BBC uh, in UK, but you know, there were parts where I had to like really stop and replay like a few parts, you know, because when 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 she starts talking like quite fast. Like sometimes, like some words you just don't understand. But like, like I, I I'd say I understand like ninety eight percent of everything she said. Yeah, that that was the part I was really trying to parse out, and I think maybe this is what made it hard for them. So, the one thing I was trying to research and I couldn't find anything okay. additional was I was trying to figure out did they actually have. They had some kind of speech impediment, it seems like. But the problem is, just think like, okay, yes. So they've got the regional Welsh accent, which you know maybe is a little bit harder to understand. I need to like give you a little like breakdown of like yeah. the situation. Wales is crazy with the language sometimes. Like the oh, yeah. signs are insane. The names and the stuff, the, right? The names, the, like it's the, the and L's it's, and the Y's know, and the right. N's next to each other. I've been. I've been all over like the United Kingdom, like the whole island. I, I think I yeah. haven't been to like maybe I haven't been to like mainland Ireland, like not uh, the northern part, like the northern Ireland, you know, because I've been to northern yeah. Ireland and it's still part of like the UK uh, since I believe, uh, you know, Ireland is not anymore. So and they're pretty closely tied with with uh, England, Northern Ireland at this point. Uh, but man, when I was like 12 and I was visiting some family members that were living there, I couldn't understand anything the, the, the <laughs> local kids were saying. I remember I went to like this swimming pool slash like amusement park. And I was like, and I could speak English by, by then, you know? Uh, yeah. But like, I've learned English from Cartoon Network, watching like like little kid shows on tv so i i, I grew up on like uh, the american accent pretty much you know and right. I, when i went to like the northern ireland i remember i was like waiting for my time to like take take like the slide in the like in like the pool uh, like uh, little slide something like that and then this little like ginger kid was said something like so fast i was like i just nodded at him and he and he said it again i was like Yo, what are you saying right now? Like, I couldn't understand anything. So to that point, yeah, definitely. People like around UK, there are definitely areas where you have no idea what the hell uh, people are telling you and you're like just nodding, you know? So imagine like that must have been even harder because then it's, you know, like everybody there accepts that as like what vanilla english is right so right, then yeah. these, these two these two kids that can't seem to get the words out right out of their mouth so like one thing i was trying to figure out was just because like i said when, when she talks it's like you can definitely understand the words and you can hear the the i guess the welsh accent and but it's like it's like she's not opening her mouth wide something something seems off and i it can't was tell in that's the, a uh... deformity in her tongue like i don't i don't know all of the causes of speech impediments why people have them i will say though Right. that having a speech impediment like i have a, a kind of a stutter like that i've had i've had a stutter that kind of gets worse or gets gets better mm. over the years i've had some years where it's been pretty bad or like sometimes when i get just excited or nervous i think i might stutter more but like it doesn't make you feel good to have someone make fun of it right so yeah, like yeah, i think I, that i bet that it doesn't you know it could, it could, it could really it be like it doesn't help it, 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 as, as, as much as people think they're like correcting you it's like no you just just making me feel worse about it yeah so like that's i think i don't know so, so there was that going on in their lives and then it makes the other it, thing it, that was yeah like from what i've gathered you know the actually in school uh well i i don't think we mentioned this uh they had a really and this, there was a lot of confusion online with this. They had an accent from Barbados, but it was not Patois. There's like this thing called Patois. I'm not sure. Pa, from... pa, yeah, 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 or uh, Patois. But, yeah, but it's so not that. A... But it's not that. It, it actually was yeah. some sort of a different uh, the... ch Carol, Carol from Barbados. Oh, Creole. Creole. Yeah. Creole. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So and it was sped up, and it was also faster. 
and it was mixed yes. in with with English. So uh, as the years went by, you know, they they started off uh, speaking somewhat understandable language when they were kids for, for for like everyone else everyone else sort of understood it but i assume they just made fun of it because uh they just pretty much you know uh were different and they were getting picked on by the the kids in the school regardless because they were black essentially you know which is really unfortunate yeah. it 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 really makes me feel bad for them but then as the years went by their their language actually was like becoming more and more like difficult to understand and at one point i think it actually got to the point where people literally could not understand them for a while and not not because at the beginning i feel like people were just making fun out of them uh because you know they were uh this is, you know they, they were like the only black uh black kids in 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 the whole town and that's pretty much just what happened you know but then yeah. after a while they actually developed a really really difficult language to understand so you know it it progressed essentially yeah and, and it, so there was this is i think where I, maybe i have some personal insight just from who i'm married to so um right. my uh, uh so creole is actually a term for when english has been mixed with another language and you oh. see it it's, okay. it's 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 most commonly a lot of times when you use the word creole here in america yeah. in the u.s pe people think about um new orleans because there's a kind of creole that's kind of like a like, like a french english mm. um creole that's used in like um new orleans louisiana um so that's what people think of but it's actually a, a more broad term so creole like you said could be um so it's essentially a most uh, kind of like I, I you know it's kind of like like you said with the little kid the little welsh kid that spoke this kind of weird little little fast version of english yeah. um it's it's kind of like a shorthand english that like you said has been it's the grammar's been changed it's been mixed around so my wife my wife speaks belizean creole and because i've been around her mm. and her family for so long i actually understand it really well uh, pretty well so when i when i'm when i'm in belize um because people down people in Belize and other parts of the Caribbean are so used to somebody not from the Caribbean having a hard time understanding them because yeah. it does really sound really different but they don't really need to, to not they don't need to translate for me like I understand because okay. I've been around it so much it's just right. it's like it's like it's like if you lived in, in Mexico for 20 years you would probably understand Spanish at some point right so it's, 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 it's like the, the Spanglish kind of, version right yeah 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 it's Something kind of like, like, like just, just 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 yeah. just knowing your your ear gets used to knowing what to listen for and like you said it's it's still english it's just sometimes the words are mixed mixed around so it's kind of weird because it's, it's interesting when i was doing the research on this thing a yeah. couple things so one thing is her parents i'll say her so this is me talking me talking me being used to hearing my in-laws and other belizean you know family members at this point my in-laws yep. speak creole her parents, I found really hard to understand, especially her father. So, wait for just real? think. Yeah, her father was like, I, didn't I don't get know, that. I don't. I, I, I didn't yeah, get that. Let me for, find when, it. When I, 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 was, I was trying to listen, to it, and, and you know, you know, the, the the Barbados version of Creole, I'm sure, is different than the Belizean Creole, and the accents a little bit different. But I had. Yeah, can we I, listen I, to it was, for a few seconds? Because I yeah, found a yeah, part just, where he talks. Yeah, fine find a part with the father and see how, how easy it was for to understand like right. like a part where he talks for like a good long minute okay let's let's do it okay for the forbidden place broward more when we first started going there there's a long queue and you're signing sign out and you're going through all these locked doors and all that of course you know you, you said yourself by hell what are you doing here you know <laughs> so, but of course then you got two doors and there's so you know it was bad. Of course, the worst thing for me was when, when you had to leave them. You know, the, uh, um, the, you hug, give them a hug and kiss and all that, and say, be good now and all that sort of thing. And then they were walking in the distance. I think for me, that was the hardest spot, you know, that they'd still be there, you know. Huh. Whoa. You are right. Now that I listen to it, like, I, I could, like, he, I'd, I'd say I, I, I understood, like, 90 95 percent of all the words and i obviously understood what he was saying but 
he would say something like really really quickly and you would not catch it you know because you're not used to it and you're yeah. like you're like um but but the, the general i guess the message you could definitely understand what he's trying to say uh with ease yeah. you know like but uh, at the same time it it's it's you know it takes it, it takes effort to, to to listen you know you really need to listen yeah i found him actually to be out of the whole show i found him to be the hardest person to understand and you know, once again, this this is at, at this point when they made the show. Right. Just think, he lived he had lived half of his life in I guess Wales, so that yeah. was kind of interesting. That like the, you know that just think that's his accent probably improved. I would assume over time, you know, just being around other Welsh people. So okay, so that was it. So just think, like you're you're, you're these two little little girls. You know, you might have a speech impediment already, so already the words aren't coming out right. And then at home, your parents are speaking Creole. And you're and and you know speaking like like their version of English, so I don't know that, and, and and then because they're shy, because they're getting bullied, because they're interacting mainly with each other, none of those things are helping to to help them speak more clearly, right? It's just it's just yeah. doubling down, nah. doubling down on speaking Creole to each other. Now the other thing that I, I think real quick because this comes up for this case, but also there's a, a famous case right around the same actually was actually after this but i think in the media it was around the same time um there's a there's something that they thought happened with twins called cryptophagia so cryptophagia is where twins supposedly come up with their own language but the interesting thing is for both this case and the famous case in america the famous case in america was there were two little girls once again is this the case uh, yeah, yeah, oh, where, where they're. I found it because I, I also found it. Yeah. yeah. Could you could you give me like some more information on this case because I didn't. Really... Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's it's kind of a sad thing because because right now, the two the two grown up now grown up women doesn't seem like they achieve much in their lives and it's hard to tell if it's because their their family was a bunch of dummies or you know because they weren't given the right hmm. care and attention. But what happened was um, these twins were born. To what seems like a pretty low-income family, it was a family that was like on like public Wait, assistance already. One, one more, one more question. Yeah. Are, are these for like are these the Papin sisters? Papin? No. Uh, I think these are the Kennedy. Is it the Kennedy okay, sisters? Okay. Okay. Yeah. The... Then, then I don't know okay. about this case yet. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, the, so the case that I'm thinking of uh, happened, I think around the the late seventies, early eighties, was mm-hmm. um, it's kind of a low-income family. These twins are born, and they both had seizures. And one of the doctors Yikes. kind of, yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, they, they, at first they were normal, but then they both, for whatever reason, they had seizures. I mean, but mm. it, like, like I've had a, I've had a pediatrician tell me that basically you get one free seizure in your life before they think anything's wrong. So, it doesn't necessarily whatever the reason was, some doctor had kind of off, offhandedly told the father, and it seems like the father was kind of a dummy, mm. um, that like, oh. They might have developmental issues, and that the doc, the, the father, without questioning this or ever following up on it, just took that to mean that absolutely they would have developmental issues. And because of this, because of that one statement, these two dummy parents don't pay the kids any attention past like the minimum. So these two kids, and then, the, and then while the parents are working or what? not yeah, working, this is her, stupid. This like, is this oh is a, like a sad, a sad case that almost like. Almost yeah. deserves its own episode, but I guess it's it's too too depressing. Um, they they're yeah. basically left left in the care of their grandmother, and once again, it's like none of these adults are really barely interacting with them. The grandmother only speaks German. The parents barely speak to them. So as a result, these two kids develop their own kind of like Creole or patois mixture. So they thought pe- people thought that it was some kind of cryptophagia secret language. It kind of was because. Nobody else was talking to her. They were only talking to each other. And it turned out, intellectually, they were pretty much normal, even though they both seem to have kind of underachieved in life. But you know, Which it's is because understandable the because the yeah, obvious reasons, they were you know, like n- n- neglected in the first five years of their right. life. So Jeez. yeah, but 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 then and afterwards, when they really analyzed it, they said, "Oh no, it's actually a mix of German and English." Which are, by the way, related languages. But yeah. um, that's that's so. But but it was like kind of the example they use of what's called. So crypto is like kind of secret, and phasia I guess is, is the, the language part uh, root. So that's that's what that means. But mm. it, oh, just as a side note, if anyone's ever seen the Jodie Foster movie Nell, 
um, where she she's supposed to be a child like that, and she talks kind of funny talk like that. That's supposed to be like an example of that. Cryptophagia. She used to foster moving Nell. Yeah, she did it in the early '90s. Sometimes people make fun of it because she talks pretty 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 strangely in it. I mean, it's almost. We watched it here. And, well, she talks know. pretty strangely on every movie. <laughs> I found that she no, was this, really oh, well, this old. one. This one, she was. She was like. Uh, I mean, she won. She won awards for the movie, so it's not like it was a ridiculous right, right, movie. Right, right, but right. It, it could be a little bit comical, depending on how you watch it. I don't know, but it's supposed to be oh, that kind of perspective. Liam Neeson as well. So yeah, yeah, Liam Neeson, like just as his career was really getting legs under it. Nice. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, anyways, so that's an example of it. So, so yeah, the ones just getting, getting back to the silent twins. Yeah, so here's here's an issue. They already had, had some strikes against them. They had, you know, they, they were coming in as outsiders to the society. They probably are not getting the right verbal coaching and how to speak the native language for that area. And it's a, like you said, it's an area with a very specific dialect and accent. And... Because of this, and they're coming into England, sorry, the UK in a period when they're kind of like the first bunch of like immigrants who don't look like the natives, let's say, the people that live in the area. So they they really stick out, and it's really hard mm. to be the first one of anything coming oh, in yeah, there. So, definitely. Yeah. so they're getting discriminated against, and they're getting treated weird. And then they're acting weird because they're getting treated weird. So then that makes them even weirder and makes people treat them worse. So at some point, the bullying was getting so bad that they were actually sending them home early ahead of the other kids so they wouldn't get pestered the whole way home. And then they would go home and lock themselves in their room all day and only interact with like one of their other siblings and even barely that at some point. They just, they the just little would only sister interact with The little, little sister was like named Rosie, Rose. Yeah, and yeah. She actually seemed to play a pretty big role in uh, the, you know, June and Jennifer's lives because she was essentially the only person that they talked to, you know, like on a yeah. regular basis was their uh, their little sister Rose. So not even their yeah. parents that they would interact with, and this this is I think where we also start to wonder. Yeah. This is where the authorities start to wonder at some point if there's also mental illness going on. So this is where it's, it's hard it's hard to tell, especially with children. We talked about this before. Right. How sometimes adults adults don't take mental illness in children seriously because kids are just weird anyway but they were acting weird enough and there were enough things going on and maybe maybe this is where whales was a little bit ahead of their time that they were actually trying they were kind of progressive they were trying mm -hmm. to see there was always a suspicion that maybe one or both of them had schizophrenia and um uh some of the other stuff that turns up later yeah. kind of makes it look like it might have been an accurate description um, there's things called like catatonic schizophrenia. There's different kinds of schizophrenia, and some of the behaviors were similar to this. But but so what happens is the state starts intervening, and um, they I, th I think at some point they even tried to separate this. Uh, this is the point where they first tried to yeah. separate them. The timeline well. the timeline is a little bit choppy yeah. online. You can't at least I couldn't really find like a place or, like one like one piece of like i don't know like one source that had the timeline laid out uh, like you know well because you have to really on this case collect bits and pieces and and paste them together so you know before they were actually uh did those uh, things that you've mentioned before that sort of indicate potential schizophrenia uh they actually there was a, an attempt to separate them because actually they had diaries. We did not mention this fact that they both had diaries and in those diaries, they they were pretty, I mean, those diaries were, were pretty in depth on their lives, you know? So oh, they, yeah. they, one of the diaries uh, had entries that suggested that things would be a lot better if they were like split apart, you know? So. I guess someone, uh, a counselor or something, read that that entry and and thought it was a good idea to really try to put them in different boarding schools. Uh, but it actually completely backfired because they became catatonic. Now I, I'm I wasn't really certain what that meant, and from my research, you like basically 
become like immobile and you don't do anything and you just like do the bare minimum the whole day or something along those lines, right? Yeah, like like zone out basically. And, yeah. And that, yeah. And it so backfired that was, as well. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was the that was one 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 attempt where they did it. I think it backfired. I think it even got. It even got got worse than catatonic for, from I think the show that you and I watched where at one point when they tried it they started getting like almost violent or, or hysterical. Um, I didn't get that part where they were try- there were entries. Uh, I mean in that show that they were allegedly plotting to kill one another, which was really yeah. odd. Yeah, the show the show kind of jumped around to that. Like you said, it was unfortunate yeah. sometimes that they they disrupted the timeline. I will say that. What happened besides that attempt was they also um, they took them out of the mainstream school and they put them into basically a special education school. Um, so a, a school for for kids that are having you know various difficulties, including mental difficulties. Yeah. And I think at this point they're they're thinking, okay, they they both qualify because they they're kind of described as at one point they even refused to to read or write at school, even though they attended. There was. There was one thing where they showed them eating, where they would take they would take longer to eat their meal than like everyone else in the entire cafeteria. But, yo, you just uh, it's excellent that you've brought this point up, because I'm not sure if you know about this whole situation. Like I have this uh, clip right here where yeah, they're that's eating the yeah. really slowly. So this was actually a game on that day. This was not like on a regular basis. This was not a thing that they did on a regular basis because June, years later, after the case, uh, you know, actually after everything, uh, after Jennifer passed and so on, uh, she was shown by a documentary, I guess, producers, this clip of them eating really slowly. And she sort of giggled and said that this was only a game that day. So th- they were not acting like this on a regular basis. Because when I was watching this, I was yeah. like, this is crazy. But this this was actually not uh, what they did on a regular basis. They were actually fighting on this day. And they were not talking to each other. So you can see they're not talking to each other. And yeah, pretty much uh, they just showed that clip. Well, but they didn't uh, really was... explain the clip, you know. They the what they actually did on that they were, were fighting, and it was a game who could eat the slowest. So that's why they took so long. So so yeah. So there's a lot of misinformation on this case where a lot of people like made it out to be creepier than it actually was, and the na- narration on the documentary was, look at these two little twins. They are crazy they're reading so slow like something along those lines you uh, know, without like giving the proper being... explanation that this was just a game on that day and this was well, not what they did on a regular basis i wonder so like i said it's interesting she gives that explanation i wonder how credible she is because we don't we don't have exactly. uh, for, you, you for have, reasons you we'll talk about point. yeah you have a yeah, point as we, well so yeah i mean if it was a joke the joke was on them because they they definitely screwed themselves by doing things like this um, because it's like you know it, it, the, once again you could say that's them not acting age appropriate for what everyone else is doing like everyone else in that cafeteria is getting with the program because like there's other stuff to do today and as much as what they were doing maybe would have been okay for like two five year olds yeah. for two people two two teenagers. Who, who they're trying to get on some sort of normal track. I mean, especially I guess, when you're getting filmed by camera, you know, so that's also yeah. like, it's probably really bad I mean, timing. I mean, I mean, if you don't games. like, if you don't like being stuck into like mental institutions and um, boarding schools for special education, I would argue that was the wrong way to act. Um, so that, <laughs> but they were so kids, what, you know, the, I mean, yeah, come on, man. So, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, but maybe that, that lends credibility to, to some of the, you know, like, like I could see somebody with schizophrenia, however, feeling like oh, yeah. that was appropriate and, and that, you know, who cares what everyone else wants. Like, like, like we kind of described in some yeah, of the other yeah. episodes about a kid I knew. So yeah. So, you know, once again, it's like, cause that, the, the kid I knew with schizophrenia. Yeah. He did kind of act like that where he kind of didn't really feel like anything else was real and whatever he wanted to do was sort of mm. the thing to do. So, you know, his agenda was the one that he went with. Um, not that he wanted to be like that. But, exactly. okay, so 
so the other thing I, I thought was interesting was that you know they they they, they showed that the thing was interesting because it showed that they the state definitely made some some pretty intensive efforts and you know they, they were recording it I think they were documenting it maybe that maybe it was good that they documented it because I think there were some allegations that the, the state didn't do well by them and I think we'll, we'll we'll debate that later about whether some of the accusations against the UK are fair but yeah I mean it looks like they really the especially me me here in a country where the, the government doesn't like to spend a lot of money on the mentally ill anymore like they certainly made a lot of efforts back then they were trying to right, mainstream right. these yeah. two little girls it seems like there was a genuine effort they were really going out of their way to try to see what could be done to try to get two people on, on what I guess people would would say is some kind of normal track for their lives where they're reading and writing and interacting with other other peers mm-hmm. and you know you yeah. know as, as much as you can't fix people being prejudiced towards them or um you know bullying them you, you try to fix it but you know that's a challenge that yeah. you know it's more complicated i think they were at least trying to see what kind of intervention they could do they and actually, i think they were also yeah, yeah they, they actually filmed them hid, with like hidden cameras because at first yeah. they, were, they didn't really know if they were speaking at all or you know they wanted to get a glimpse into how they interact with each other because at some point they they definitely thought that they may not be speaking to us but they're definitely speaking to each other when they're you know uh not around other people so they actually did a whole like they rigged a room that they were like studying something like that and they actually uh, got the hidden footage uh, where they started talking to each other and you know after a while i guess uh, the the two twins they actually started talking with the counselors as well a little bit so you know yeah it was it was an interesting little ploy they did I mean they used to it's so funny because now it's like stuff like that sometimes runs into ethics issues um, but back right. then yeah. back then there was <laughs> there's just some other funny stuff I should say sometimes where think, they, they did experiments yeah. like that with kids but yeah what I was gonna say is like oh well, yeah definitely uh, what I was going to say was that the timeline is once again really choppy even on our end right now because this was all happening I believe uh, before they were there was the attempt to separate them because when they got separated uh, and they essentially became catatonic then this was a really odd part for me for the next two years they just stayed in the in their rooms like sh- they they became essentially essentially shut-ins and did nothing they applied for a creative writing course uh, through like mail because and they paid for it uh, by like I, I guess adding both of theirs uh, unemplo- unemployment checks so a lot of weird weird little things like that uh, in this case but essentially they become writers right at some point yeah so I, I don't know man uh, are we, uh, did I skip a little bit too much or oh, no I mean I think I mean yeah no not really I mean I think it's a perfect transition is yeah they, they both they both kind of figure out that they're um that they have kind of this love for telling stories and they, they start writing these really, really kind of in-depth, like kind of soap opera stories about... The Pepsi Cola addict? Yeah, yeah. Like like these stories are like kind of like Pulp Fiction kind of stories. They're, they're, they're more like... Uh, like they have these twists and they're, they're kind of like Stephen King-ish stories almost yeah, in some I mean, ways. Did yeah. You, did you read the plot for... Uh, <laughs> the one the with the... Pepsi Cola addict? Yeah, Pepsi Cola addict, or the or the other one with the, the the doctor and the dog and the dog's heart and his Bug kid. And, yeah, yeah. I actually yeah, did like... some research on these books, and you know, <laughs> I've you can actually buy this book. The Pepsi Cola addict is up for sale, by the way. Um, oh, wow. I'm trying to find uh, right. So the Pepsi Cola addict, uh, the hero of this book, is a high school. Uh, I guess a uh, high schooler who was seduced by a teacher then sent away to a reformatory where a homosexual guard makes a p- 
play for him and it's called the PepsiCo Addict. So you know it's definitely like all over the place. Someone made this uh, little sketch online I found like about the PepsiCo Addict. I'm pretty sure this uh, links up with the twins. I'm pretty sure that's the case. So it's a little bit like a weird painting right here. Now, what the interesting part is like you can actually get the PepsiCo Addict right now online and it's like on Audible, I believe. Um, get a copy yeah. on Amazon. I'm, okay, so Amazon can't find it right now, but like it's pretty much all over the place and the reviews are actually really good. You know, uh, I, can, I'm, I only see like some, some like mediocre reviews, but yeah. So it's a self-published novel by June Allison Gibbons. So the older twin, one of the silent twins, essentially. Preston Wildly King, 14, lives in Malibu with his widowed mother and sister. He's literally addicted to Pepsi to the point that all his thoughts and fantasies are focused on it. When he's not drinking it, he's dreaming about it, even creating art and poetry based on it. Uh, it amounts to his re religion. So basically, it's a dude addicted to Pepsi Cola, and it actually didn't do that well in the UK because they self published these books. So this was uh, June's book. Um, right there are actually ways you could get this book for free online uh, you sign up for this website and you download it now I'm not, I'm not sure about the legality of that process so I'm just gonna leave it at that um, yeah. also Jennifer Gibbons is also on goodreads.com and she also had made books so it was the pug list so I believe the pug list was the one where uh, a surgeon tries to save his kid's life by taking the family dog's heart out and putting in the kids like replacing the dog's heart with the kid's heart and then the dog uh, essentially the dog spirit lives on in the kid and he takes revenge on the father so probably killing him or something like that didn't really research in that much also she made disco mania Oh, Discomania was made by June. I I'm sorry. June made Discomania, a, a book where some sort of a disco turns the attendees into murderous killers, something along those lines. So it their books had a touch of, you know, a uh, touch of uh, like a murder e Stephen Kingish. You You definitely got that correct, you know? Yeah, yeah, which I guess it makes sense. I mean, it was sort of the era where that kind of those kind of more edgy stories, like even Stephen King, case in point. I mean, I, I read those books, you know. Uh, yeah, like most, I guess, teenagers that or like people or that age would would write, you know, the books that would be considered more normal would be boring as hell. You know, like no one wants to read boring stories. And the Pepsi Cola addict seems like something I'm gonna try to, to to get online, you know, and see what it's all about. Cause that actually sounds interesting, you know. So yeah, yeah. and they they both had this. I mean, which isn't unusual for for Britain. They had a, a fascination with America and Malibu. Like I said, Malibu was the the setting right. for a lot of the a lot of the movies, and that's. That makes sense. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, Malibu is pretty nice, I have to say, though it's probably not exactly what everybody imagines it is. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I mean, so they, you know, they, they that's an interesting thing is, um, oh, oh, the other thing I'll say is they read a couple of her, her poems um, uh, that I think it was June's poems on the show, and I was pretty impressed. I mean, they were actually... Uh, pretty pretty good efforts. I think the only one I didn't like was the one she did uh, for the epitaph for her sister. But their, their writing skills were actually quite amazing. Like they read yeah. the diary, even like their diary was amazing. Like these, they were great writers. You know, I could definitely not even come close to writing like they did. You know, uh, because you definitely see when they read their, I guess, you know, uh, writings on that. Uh, BBC documentary, they, they seem really professional, you know, like a professional writer wrote them almost, you know, so yeah, so 
the the whole thing with them like having low low intelligence i i, I really don't don't think it's the case you know because mm. there were accusations that they were like their intelligence level were, were were like low but i i actually think it may have been above average you know because they seemed really smart like that you know yeah exactly it just seemed like they needed to put they needed to have the the desire i guess the motivation to, to spend yeah. time on it and they this seems to be what they actually decided to focus their efforts on so they were successful at it and i guess maybe that's the case for a right. lot of things in life it's just putting in the, the the time with diligent effort mm. and trying to trying to improve so yeah they, they did that so that was that was one interesting thing and then the part that i admittedly i was doing something else while i was watching the show okay. but i guess they, they started with dating a couple of boys who were kind of like bad boys from like the same from treatment USA. program or something i think it was like yeah some, no i don't think they were like from the same treatment pro program i think they were yeah uh, u.s nationals whose parents were also in the military and they were stationed in the uh, uk so it was okay. that type of situation so yeah. from what i've gathered these two boys were like bad influences yeah uh, so because they were vandalizing the like the streets stealing stuff setting things on fire and <sighs> yeah so essentially they leave after i believe a year or i could be wrong maybe even longer they leave and i guess what they leave behind are like these two twins uh, june and jennifer who are heavily influenced to do similar sort of activities so they also start i guess i i, I didn't really look into their crime record but there's obviously this one thing that we all know about uh the the arson case so I, I I think they did some minor stuff before setting this whole big building on fire, but, yeah. but they didn't get caught for for any of those minor things or at least the I guess the I don't know man the consequences would not be as dire as they were after they set it on fire, uh, after they set this whole big building on fire mm -hmm. in Wales, and how they got caught was they actually mentioned it. In the diary there was an entry now I'm not gonna say for sure who wrote the entry was it Jennifer or was it June but the entry stated that something along the lines how, why should I not get the chance to express my pain something like that uh, and essentially sort of they self implicated themselves in this case because I don't know whose idea was to get to read their diaries, but maybe they were already known to the police for doing minor stuff. So they were, and they were, and they kept like pretty, like in depth diaries. So probably the police office was like hand over the the diaries, and they found out that you know there is this big, well written. Uh, with like a lot of details and really about how they set this place on fire and that's how they got convicted so you know breezing past the conviction because that's just the legality part which also was a messed up situation with the legal uh, system as well in this case but just to get like the i guess what happened next out of the way so that we could really get into the interesting uh, parts they pled guilty uh to that arson case and they actually didn't go to jail they were transformed to this hospital for people that have mental issues i'm going to try to find the name of this broadmoor hospital it was called the, yeah it was called bradmore hospital it was a high security mental health institution it's basic it basically looks like you know what it looks like it looks like where they held pirates back in like the <laughs> 16th century but it does you know have you ever seen the movie bronson Nah. oh no that's a famous movie it's about this uh this like criminal who is like super violent and uh right uh and, and at one point i think he i think he gets committed to the same hospital because they were just so tired of him being so violent yeah, um and he, he, he did yeah, I think I think it was the same one, and, and at one point he actually Rodmore? takes this, 
I think so. Yeah, I'll, let me let me check on that. But yeah, he he actually he actually took some of the staff hostage. So I mean, they're used to these. Yeah, let me see. Let me see Bronson and look what? up look, look up the movie Bronson with um yeah, what's his name? Um, Mad Max guy. Um, uh, just can't see right now. Yeah, uh, Bronson Broadmoor. Yeah, yeah, it was Broadmoor House. It was the same hospital. This is a, this is a famous mental hospital. Uh, Charles, the, the 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 guy's name is Charles Bronson, but that's like his nickname. Yeah. Charles Ar- Arthur Salvador. Anyways, yeah. So the place is real famous. It's like a big time. It's like a it's like a a well known mental hospital. So yeah, I mean, here's the thing: when they were hanging out oh, with those two with Tom, boys, Tom, it's with Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so there's, there's there's a part in the movie where he, where he takes he jumps up on the roof of that that same hospital um Holy so yeah so, God, so the movie's crazy yeah by the way I, I recommend it but it's intense um right it's, it's a great it's so so here's the thing about them just just before they get they, they go to broadmoor i think it is interesting that like look they here's something that's it's sort of a common factor that um if they did have something like schizophrenia was potentially an exacerbating circumstance that maybe made things a lot worse. So, and maybe maybe this is to your point. Maybe maybe they wanted to get caught. Maybe they wanted to end up in treatment because they start doing drugs and alcohol. So they start doing you know drinking, marijuana, and that's been known to exacerbate symptoms in people with pre-existing um, mental illness, uh, especially things like schizophrenia. It's been known to kind of push them mm. a lot further into it. Right. So if they did have schizophrenia, that would make it potentially worse and here's the thing yeah they started doing behavior that yeah they burned down a plate they did two hundred thousand dollars worth of damage burning down like a a tractor selling facility or something like that Mm. and then they tried to burn down a junior high so at this point if you're the state it's like what do you do like you find these two people they've already kind of (laughs) you've you've already had had to, to interact with them before trying to help them and now you know as soon as they were not being monitored that much they did a series of destructive things that seems there to be were, there were entries in one of the in one of the diaries i forgot to mention that they were essentially going to continue their work yeah. uh setting buildings on fire until they get caught so you know uh it definitely would make sense that they did it on purpose just to get institutionalized maybe i don't know yeah i mean i mean there was so if you're the state like what else can you do it's not like you can you know no it's dangerous you can't have them like setting things on fire it's definitely not an option and then what's next right like like this wasn't enough to get attention now do we have to kill somebody so then yeah it's oh yeah it's it's not looking good and this is i think where this is where there's there's I guess this is a major phase of their life where they go to this this place they go to. It's not a joke. It's not just some minor hospital. It's 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 like a hospital jail. It's for the seriously mentally. It's it's for the dangerous dangerous mentally people ill people who have like committed murders and things like that were like yeah. actually stationed with them as well in that hospital. So it yeah, was, yeah, it, it was a bad time, you know. If you get if you if you kill somebody. And you're found not not mentally competent. Like this is where you go. Yeah. So this, yeah. So this this so is not a joke. That, there's a whole bunch of people. I I think it's even worse than the regular jail, probably, because yeah. at least those people sort of have like there there's some sort of a reasoning either for money or for something, you know. But like these girls were sent sent to a hospital with people that probably there were probably people who killed for no reason and didn't even feel anything about it you know because they're they're mentally ill you know right right and this is where they also start getting medicated pretty extensively and this is it's interesting because they're you know you read the wikipedia and some of you know you hear sort of their side of it at least via june june tells their side of it and it seems like they're kind of resentful and they said well it killed their creativity and I guess after this, after this whole period, their writing skills never really seemed to be the same. Um, they, they lost they stopped. interest, right? Yeah, they lost interest, and I, I would say they probably lost 
a lot of the skills just from not practicing or, or whatever changes happen in their brain. Yeah. But it is interesting because some of their behavior started to actually become more normal with this medication. So they started actually interacting with people a little more. And and like I said, at some point, they, they even tried separating them again. And the weird thing, the eerie, there was a, one eerie thing. And maybe this is just an example of how a twin is the copy of another person was that when they would separate them and they would go into those kind of like catatonic, like zoned out body states where they would just freeze in a weird position, even though they were in two different parts of the hospital, they would be in the same position. It was so strange. It was what? like, yeah, yeah. That was one of the, the descriptions was that they would. No way. Wait, yeah, this, this, is, yeah. this is not, uh, this is some, you know what I mean? This is some freaky stuff right here. Strange stuff, no. yeah. So, what? I didn't catch so, this. So that's that's like always the paranormal thing with twins, because sometimes twins what? Act, act act as if they have a connection, and there's always like kind of anecdotal stuff about like a twin knowing when like their other twin died, even though they were separated. So you always wonder, is it like some kind of weird psychic connection, or is it just 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 that you know Yo, the same reason this how is... like. I, I I didn't know about that one. You know, this is yeah. this is new information for me. Ugh. Yo, this then, is crazy. But then, but then sometimes I mean, you look at how like you have like one of the most uh, useful studies with twins is um, you know yeah. for for like for like uh, science and the, the science establishment and for psychology, you can't ethically do like experiments to children where you say, oh, let's take two children. That are exactly the same and have one have a really messed up life and the other one have a great life and then study them. You can't do that ethically, right? Like you can't you can't do that on purpose. Right. No, but, not not anymore, but like back in the wait, early nineteenth yeah. century twentieth <laughs> century. Some places, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some places, but, yeah. But but the thing is, in real life, there are twins that, you know, are born to mothers who give them up or born, you know, to, to, to whatever reason they end up in the foster, the foster child system yes. and they get separated at a very young age. And yes, the interesting yes. thing is that gives psychologists and other scientists the ability to study things about how two people that would otherwise be exactly the same in different environments, um, whether they end up differently. And the interesting thing is a lot of times they end up with the exact same kind of job, the same kind of everything, even though they grew up in two different families. Oh, for so that, real? I, I was going yeah. to... Yeah. I was, I was anticipating that you were going to say that they com turn out completely different, but they still... Not, they yeah, yeah. A oh, lot of, wow. I mean, not, 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 not like, I mean, obviously there's there's differences, but not, yeah, it'll be something like literally like they'll, they'll both be teachers or they'll both be doctors or huh. they'll both, you know what I mean? Even, even like the same kind of doctor. It's really strange. So that kind of speaks to maybe it's just that Twins you probably take... have something. Do you, do you think it's like, like? Do you think it's scientifically explainable, or is this like some hocus pocus right here? So I, I would I would say it's ninety percent not hocus pocus, and that like you know you take the same person and you give them relatively the same stimulus. Yeah. And and they're, they're you know they just it's just I, I don't know I've heard some people like Sam Harris say that. You know, we don't even have free will. That kind of our biology determines everything. I'm not sure about that, but, but then, mm. but then you do have the thing that happens where you'll have a twin who said that they knew instantly when their other twin, who was a thousand miles away, died. They Come just on, knew. Man. Come Isn't on, that crazy? man. This That's is... like the hocus pocus, right? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> right. So. Well, there was something similar in this case. I'm sure we're yeah, probably approaching yeah. this part, right? We're, we're, we're getting there. So yeah, I'll be just I'll just finish off that. Yeah, I mean they, yeah. they they had a lot of they had a lot of medication, and it was interesting that the medicate you know the, the, they were medicating them because at this point, given their behavior, given a lot of the other things that happened in their life, and and even taking into account the cultural and social factors that you know had impacted them. They said, you know, the, the, there does seem to be potentially some kind of schizophrenia, some kind of mental issues that are causing this. And, and the interesting thing is, like, like even even the twins themselves in their diaries and their, their conversations to each other, they really did, they actually agreed in a lot of these diagnoses that whatever solution there was to the problem, the fact that 
them being together was like a crutch for for one another. Like, oh, a, yeah, like yeah. you know what I mean? It was it was not helping them get better. They were yeah, I've, I've, yeah. They definitely agreed on that. I definitely also got that yeah information. Yeah, as that well. they were. So then that came around to what was the solution? So the solution was oh, the solution. One of them, yeah, but <laughs> I mean, was it's, that one of them but it's to really die. crazy. Yeah, that one of them was going to die, but. You know, the one thing I didn't get uh, clear with the solution is when did they, uh, did they devise, the yeah, when when did they come up with the solution? Because was it like back in the day or was it already when they were in the, in Broadmaster? Or Broadmoor. Whatever? Broadmoor, Broadmoor, yeah. yeah. I, I think, so that was where it was a little bit, once again, the show kind of jumped around and all the sources yes. jumped around a lot of it. I, I got the sense... That it mostly happened in Broadmoor, where they, I mean, they'd had maybe an ongoing conversation about the topic their whole lives, but at some point at Broadmoor, I guess, because Broadmoor is like kind of the, they've hit rock bottom in yes. some ways. Right? Yes. This yes. is not, this is, I mean, from, from this point on, they're just, even when they're getting, when there's less focus on them because, you know they've been under medical treatment, etc., and they're not being violent. And they're not, like you said, compared to some of the other people in Broadmoor, they're like, like, like a, a, you know, not really a problem compared to a lot of people that are in there. They they did something bad at the age where teenagers do things bad, do do do, do bad things. So maybe they they kind of looked at it like that. But anyway, yeah, they go well. The solution is one of us needs to die, and then the other person can kind of go on with their life and be normal. And that's where we get to. Uh, they were getting transferred to right. A so just facility. just yeah. a, a quick little, uh, I guess, interruption here because I think we missed a few details. And one of the yeah. interesting details is that you know when you're a juvenile delinquent, you most you know because like you could probably say that they fit that description at some point. You know, setting things on fire. Uh, it's yeah, you, you're you're essentially a juvenile delinquent, even though you know yeah. they were probably good people, but they were acting ira- irrationally. That you know they probably they definitely had to be stopped just for other people's safety, you know. Uh, right. And so most juvenile delinquents they actually get like two or three years, like tops, and they're out, but they stayed in. They stayed in that hospital, Broadmoor, for 11 years. So every two years or so, or even every year, I can't really tell. They were like, uh, what? What is it called again? When you sort of uh, ask the COs and whatever if you can like leave the, if you can go essentially. That's uh, sort of like a. Like a, like a board of review or something. Yeah, yeah. So they had those board of reviews annually, I believe, and they kept pushing them back. They were telling them, you you need to make a little bit more progress. And then the, the next year, still need to make that progress. The next year, a little bit more progress. So I could only imagine how it felt for, how it must have felt for them. You know, they were stuck there for so long. I think it was... I think they were definitely overlooked their case and they didn't you know get the proper help or the attention from the state at that point because I believe once they uh, threw them in that hospital uh, they were like sort of written off like everyone else in there you know so I think it was an unfortunate situation maybe if they got them into a less uh, strict uh, mental hospital maybe things would have turned out better so they do these uh, board of review types of situations they get pushed back and then on this one uh, occasion they actually ask not to get released but to get transferred to a less strict mental institution called the Caswell Clinic in Bridge and Wales so probably a less strict institution definitely and i have it somewhere so this is how that place looked like so it's it still looks heavy duty you know but it's 
you, I can definitely see that the, the windows are still fenced off, but it seems a little bit more less strict because that other one was like a legit prison you know so this this was probably yeah, an institution and yeah like if you wanted you could take it away because what followed next was i guess the big mystery in this case and the, the only thing that is really hard to explain and i couldn't really uh, find a proper explanation online you know yeah so um you know the day or, or the maybe the, the right around the time uh, it's time for them to be transported to this new facility. Um, Jennifer, who had been the, the twin out of the two of them, who decided that she was the one that needed to die before the before June could go on and live a normal life, she starts complaining of not feeling so well and like things being kind of blurry and, and her speech starts getting slurred and um, when they're being, it doesn't sound like they paid much attention to it. Maybe they're used to, you know, between the, all the medications people are taking and just not entirely reliable self reports out of the, the patients at the hospital. Yeah. Um, you know, they just, maybe just thought, thought just whatever it was, they didn't take it too seriously. And, uh, on the trip over there, she's, kind of, she's basically saying that she can feel herself dying and she's ready to die. And she lays down in June's lap, lays her head down in her lap, and goes, goes to sleep with her eyes open. So Yikes. that's not good. Yeah, so when they get there, um, she's unresponsive, and um, she basically she, she passes away. And I think the only, the only thing they could really find when they did an autopsy, because there wasn't any appearance that she'd, like, you know, poisoned yeah. herself with anything. Yeah, there was no evidence of foul play. You know, yeah, which no, was really no. crazy because then how how do you explain this? You know, maybe, maybe it's just a coincidence, but it's it seems seems strange. I mean, she yeah, had, she had a pre-existing heart condition. I, I, yeah, I, and that was yeah. that was the only thing, right? The in, inflammation around the heart. I mean, here, here's the one thing that, that I I thought of when I read this was. By the way, she, um, she died. We know the cause of her death, by the way. So yeah, it was like the inf inflamed heart. It's called yeah. the micro. Carditis? I don't know. I've never yeah. really encountered it. So uh, it's essentially when the blood vessels sort of uh, get inflamed because the circulation of the blood, I assume, is not uh, as good as it should be. And this is a perfect uh, picture right here. You can sort of see that, you know, when a part of the heart becomes inflamed, I guess it just stops beating and then you die I mean, I mean you know what it made me think of was well one it, it seemed like maybe it's mind over matter because um you always read about that where you have like two old people that have been married for you know 50 years or 60 years and then mm. one of them dies and then the other one dies within 24 hours like that's not that's that's, that's oh yeah that's i've actually, heard about those stories. Yeah, yeah it's actually pretty common um, and they, they say, I've, I've read this before over the past, what, 20 plus years, sometimes they actually call it like dying of a broken heart. Like somebody, for whatever reason, being in so much emotional distress, um, that it actually has a physical impact on them. I mean, which makes sense if, I mean, if you were really upset, it doesn't seem like, I guess what's different here is it's not like somebody who was already in, in hardcore mourning because there'd been a, you know, like, like if you're, yeah. you've been married if you've, if you've been married for 60 years old, uh, sir, if you've been married for 60 years and you're 90 years old, yeah, like your whole life changed when your, your wife or your husband died. But, but for them, it, it really does seem like maybe with just their intense amount of focus on each other and mental concentration and, you know, maybe, maybe just being miserable living in that mental hospital. It doesn't sound like they, they enjoyed it very much. Um, mm, yeah. maybe, maybe she was able to summon, some sort of version of that, you know, that, that, that death by a broken heart. I, 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 what mm. I think is, I think she was able to muster somehow the right amount of concentration to essentially will herself to die. That was the only thing Jeez. I could, I could think of. Yeah. You think that's a, an actual possibility, right? I think so. Too. I mean, I've heard of it, you know, people that, I, I mean, not, not, not just the thing with the old folks in love, but like even just somebody, I've seen that happen where like, 
somebody who feels an intense amount of shame or who has suffered suffered like the biggest defeat of their life and i mean that i mean that like probably in in, in more than one sense mm-hmm. you know somebody yeah. who is just their whole life has fallen apart you know, you've seen that where people suffer like fatal heart attacks and things like that that's yeah. what i that's what i think of yeah hmm, that's that's crazy to think about so i guess what happened next was even crazier because june the older sister now i don't know about the credibility of this but there are statements that she said something along the lines that she's finally free and she can go and live her life now and some of the sources online made it seem that she was happy that she died but then also i feel like that she probably wasn't and that was an exaggeration because it, it was because you know i've knew i've known about this case for years now you know because it was on my radar for like multiple years but i never okay. really looked into it in, in depth so i just had like that basic basic notion of about it so uh you know what i thought about was like that she actually did feel really happy that her sister died and now she can go and live her life but researching this case uh, i sort of starting to think that that was not the case i think she wasn't like super happy that her sister died you know yeah you know the the, the thing i wished was the the documentary we both watched where they, they really focused on her it was almost 30 years ago and it was it was it was kind of right after um yeah not, you know like 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 Jennifer had, had I mean it wasn't it wasn't that long after Jennifer had passed away right like when did, when did she die she died um uh what year was it uh I don't know what year it was oh she died in 93 so she was 29 oh, wow. years of age so it was just a year before and it's like now yeah now now June is almost 60 and I always I I, I guess I had a couple questions one is I wonder if her speech impediment, which was very, very prominent in that documentary, I wonder if it got any better with like separation from that's, her twin. That's and, a, yeah, that's really interesting. That's a good point. Yeah, we definitely. Uh, I think there was an interview with her in 2016. I couldn't find the interview, so if anyone watching this podcast wants to find that out, there's an interview. Uh, that was done in 2016 so only like four years ago because uh, yeah i guess my only thought was that was that was one of the only things that was quote unquote weird about her was that that you know where, where you could look at somebody and think that maybe something is something is strange about them was just that she she still had a kind of a hard time speak you know it, the way she yeah. talked she always sounded like there's something in her mouth. Like it, it didn't, it didn't sound quite right. Mm. And I kind of wondered, you know, is that still the case? Like, how much of that is? I think that, I think that's yeah. probably still the case now. I know there's like a way to check it. You could probably just go somewhere and do a little bit more research and find the interview from 2016. But yeah. I, I, I'm sort of leaning towards that it probably did not change because, you know, these things probably. On most occasions, uh, once you're a little bit older, those things tend to stay with you f- for life. That's why all of these like speech, uh, I guess, uh, difficulties that little kids have, uh, a lot of people emphasize that they need to be corrected while they're, the kids are still young, you know, so that they won't, yeah. don't develop the the type of uh, impairment that will last their whole lifetimes. So I don't know, man, uh, I'm not sure if, I'm sort of leaning towards it. it probably stayed the same, but it does state here on my notes that she actually is now living a normal life. She is accepted by the community. She actually lives, or at least if her parents are still alive, lives uh, near, you know her parents or like other family members and she seems to be living a normal life now she's completely self-dependent and she's probably quite smart as well you know so there's no point in thinking that she could not take care of herself uh, 
So in right. in, in a sense, it's, it's really messed up to to say, but once Chen for died, Jun's life definitely did turn around. Which is, I don't know, was it was were their lives already on an upward swing then? Were they about to get get out of uh, the medical institutions regardless but one way or another once Jennifer died June's life sort of turned around you know so it's it's uh, it's 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 definitely something yeah it's, it's strange I guess that, that, that the only other thing I, I wish I knew because it, it was really hard to tell because you know it was only a year after her sister's death and um it's hard to tell the way she was speaking and the way her facial expressions were. It's hard to tell if she was just really emotional about the topic and bitter, you know, and kind of somebody that's kind of defensive about their life. And, you know what I mean? You're not, we're not, we're not catching her in like a neutral moment. We're catching her probably where they had like an hour or two hours or something to talk about something. And You're just talking imagine about the, if, the documentary, the, 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 right? Yeah. The documentary, like just imagine if somebody catches you, in a, in a moment where you're like in a bad mood or sad or something like that, it could affect like your, but, but then the whole interview, that's all they, they see of you. Right. So like if they never met you or me, like imagine if someone catches me like an hour after I had a massive fight at home or work, they're going to think I'm like a complete jerk. They're going to think right. I'm, you know, like, or I'm, I'm unhinged rather than catch me in a good mood after a good night's sleep, etc. It would have been interesting, I guess. And that's where I, I I wish there was more material out there. It would have been interesting to see what she was like outside of this interview because, you know, I just, I, I kept on, it was so like a weird little sense of when I, when I saw her, things didn't seem entirely normal. And I don't think that she was entirely normal at that point. So it is interesting that she doesn't seem to have had any issues since then. I don't know if she was able to, what else she did with her life after that if she you know had a family or, or etc relationships yeah, yeah. I'm whatever. sure this information like, yeah. is somewhere online but I guess we can definitely respect you know her privacy yeah. by probably not digging into her life all that much right now because yeah. the only thing that you know is stated from like the really easy to get information is that she's living a normal life now so I think we could definitely yeah. Uh, leave her story at that and I guess move to the conclusions so I don't know man as I've said in the beginning of the podcast the only mystery for me here was the fact that Jennifer died uh, in a really weird fashion and there's like a whole bunch of confusion how she actually died there's sources that state that she died like two days after she was transformed uh, to that new hospital and some sources say that she died on the bus there so I think she probably died after the fact after the bus drive I think the bus drive just sort of was there to make the the case more creepy yeah so not sure really about that so I guess what you've said about like the emotional changes that sort of lead to death was uh definitely makes sense but it nothing makes sense with the fact that they were at the old uh broadmoor hospital when they were like separated that they sort of became catatonic and it, it were like in the same position doing things in the same position it was like you know i don't know how you explain that like they were like linked or something yeah right. it was a little it's, strange I don't, I, don't, I don't know how you explain that that's that's definitely some mysterious stuff right there. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, man. Um, uh, and I guess the, the last thing that we sort of, I guess, have to figure out here was was the prophecy correct? You know, uh, do you def do you believe that uh, June's life would have became normal uh, even if uh, Jennifer would not have passed away? Like if they were still both around, what do you think would have happened? I guess that's the last question here yeah I, I mean yeah it's, it's so hard to tell you like you said because they, they were kind of a, a it was almost like their their adulthood was delayed by all these things that happened yeah um so like like where they were when jennifer died 
was sort of like where everyone else is when they're like 19, 20. Um, you know, they were like 10 years delayed by everything. Yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of want to think that no, like like they, uh, you know, they just they fell into these. It was almost like a like a codependent relationship or something where they they both kind of it was too easy to you know lean back into each other and just do the same old same old yeah. by hanging out together so yeah I don't know from from my perspective it doesn't seem to have worked out so well I, I think the one thing that bothered me a little bit was because uh, obviously everyone has their opinion but this was sometimes depicted in some of the Wikipedia stuff and some of the other materials it was like oh these were two people that were misunderstood and misdiagnosed and overly medicated and you know I don't know when I when I look at the facts of, of, of this it's like to me it seems like the state tried pretty hard to fix them I mean I don't know how much speech therapy they did with them and how much that would have worked um, because I don't I don't know how effective that is with whether there was a physical thing wrong with their mouths or not like a cleft palate kind of thing where maybe there's something that's actually wrong with their tongues but i guess the, the thing that bothers me is what was the government supposed to do right like these 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 two kids that were not doing well in the school system and i mean not even really doing well interacting with their parents but their parents had to like put food under the door to feed them and they were acting in ways that were not not i mean certainly if, if your goal is to have them grow up to be normal adults that can yeah. you know you know feed themselves and you know earn earn their own keep well if that was the goal then there were certain steps they had to take and that required you know making some hard choices and some hard decisions and then when they ended up doing you know destructive acts well then that that really i mean the state's responsibility to the rest of us is to try to do what they think is best in that situation so i don't I kind of dispute where, like, someone, you know, they were mentioning the family. Some members of the family were thinking of suing, and and, and the other other members of the family are like, well, it's not going to bring anybody back. And I'm like, yeah, not only that, I don't really think you should be suing because I don't know what else the state could have done. You know, it's sort of, there's a lot of second guessing going on in this case. And yeah, it's just unfortunate. It just seems like it was a sad, sad thing going on. You know, how, how mental health gets diagnosed changes every year and every decade so you yeah. know sort of maybe it's a legacy of how schizophrenia and some of those issues were looked at back then cool um i don't know man i feel like we've talked a lot about this case and now we probably just start speculating so i think every you know like on i guess for from what you've said i assume that you don't think that uh they would uh june would would have had a normal life right if jennifer was still around because they would still have that co-dependent sort of relationship even to yeah. this day right I'm, I'm leaning actually the same way so i don't know man i think it's definitely weird how once jennifer died things really quickly turned around for june so you know that's that's something to think about right there and I guess we'll be wrapping the episode up now. So anything you want to mention to, I guess, the audience before we sign up? Uh, great to see the big boost in views for some of our content from a few weeks ago. So thank you, everyone, for your very kind and constructive comments online. And, of course, for subscribing. Be sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Right. Catch us next week on episode number 43. And as always, stay safe and peace out. Yeah.